Welcome to our lecture on torsion in beams from chapter 6, section 5. Here we show a cross section of a steel girder and a steel I beam, which we might call a filler beam or a joist, which uh, would be connected to the girder. And uh, this is just an example of how that connection might occur. There could be a plate cut to this shape and welded into the girder with some sort of connection out here, which is currently rendered just as a single bolt hole, but uh, the plate could be changed to introduce additional bolt holes. It's a commentary, by the way, about uh, steel I-beams, that they're so strong in shear that even where the shear is worst, which is at the end of the beam, we often are able to support the beam with just two or three bolts. Um, and those bolts actually are stress risers um, that create stress concentrations around the bolt holes. And in spite of all of that, um, that's more than an adequate connection. Uh, in many instances, a single bolt of uh, reasonable size is adequate to make the connection. So this is an example of how we could do this. Now, if we sort of pull these two things apart and create free bodies, we will see that the support at the end of this beam is along the center line of the end of the beam. On the other hand, the load that's created by this beam through this connecting bolt is offset a distance L in this case from the center line of the girder. So in other words, this force in combination with that force is creating a fairly substantial moment that's tending to twist this girder over. So we would see a deformation occurring in that beam uh, somewhat along these lines. So generally speaking, we would prefer not to introduce torsion into a beam anywhere we don't have to. So uh, historically we have worked out details that allow us to avoid that. And this would be the classic detail. So here we have a girder. In this case, the I-beam that's coming to attach to the girder has had its flange notched back. And this can be done with a laser cutter, a water cutter, a, a torch cutter, or whatever. Um, and that's a pretty routine kind of adjustment. In fact, it is the standard detail at the end of a beam. So we'd like the top surface of uh, this I-beam or filler beam, this wide flange beam, to be at the same surface as the top of the girder. That way, when we lay decking across it, the decking will lie flat uh, and we'll contact both of them. And then when we weld the decking down, we'll get good diaphragm action. So in this case, the top uh, flange has been notched and you'll recall we've said that um, the flanges are not a significant part of transferring shear forces that mainly occurs through the web of the I-beam. So we're making our connection here at the web and we're actually cutting away part of the flange because the flange is really not crucial to connections at the end where the shear tends to be high, but the moment is low. The last thing we'd want to do, as we mentioned in chapter one, is to cut away part of the flange out near the center of a simple span beam where the moment is very high because the flanges are crucial in transmitting moment, but not crucial in transmitting shear. You'll notice in this case, there are two clip angles that are welded to each side of this uh, I-beam or wide flange. Uh, that could be a bolted connection also, but often it's done in a shop where the welding conditions are good and a welded connection is cheaper to do than a bolted connection. It's faster and uh, every bit is strong and so it's less expensive. Um, so there are two angles here which we call clip angles. Uh, there are bolt, two bolt holes in each of them. Then there are bolt holes drilled in the web of the girder and the field connection is done by bolting through those holes. 
So we have shop cutting of the top flange, we have shop welding of the clip angles, and then field bolting of the clip angles to the web of the girder. This would be the standard connection for a filler beam or a joist connecting to a primary beam or girder. And the nice thing about this, by the way, is this beam is stiff and strong and it reaches all the way out to the web of the girder. In other words, its loads are delivered essentially right on the center line of the girder and it has no tendency to introduce uh, torque and even the slight offset, which would be half the thickness of the web of the girder, uh, the tiny amount of moment that's induced by that is more than taken up by the stiffness or the resistance of these clip angles. So, as we said, if we had an offset load, we are introducing torque, and we, would, we have ways of avoiding this generally, but we'd like to talk about what the implications of it are because sometimes we can't avoid offset loads and we end up with torque on beams. So here we've got a, a, nice, a wide flange a girder which is showing large amounts of deformation. Now if we go and we ask ourselves what's the pattern of shear stress on the uh, cross section of that beam that's being caused by this torsional influence. It looks something like this. There's a shear stress that's high near the boundary that goes around here, traces all the way around there, up this side of the flange, across there, and back to here. Now, this diagram is, is like so many things we do with arrows, it's, it's just sort of a schematic indicator. These uh, shear stress arrows are large right near the boundary. They go to zero at the center and then they rise again near the outside. The key thing is they're uh, basically um, concentrated or most intense near the surfaces of the beam. Now we can go through and we can divvy up all the parts of the cross section and you'll notice I've drawn a little rectangle here and I've said let's cluster that force arrow and that force arrow together and we'll say they represent a, a pure couple or a pure moment and uh, basically we're going to say the lever arm of that is less than the thickness of whatever that flange is. So it wouldn't be uncommon for that flange to be a half an inch thick for some of the common sections that we use in beams and a half an inch is a pretty small lever arm. So we would have to say these shear forces which are crucial to resisting the torsional influence on this beam have rather modest uh, lever arms and as a consequence we expect the shear stresses to be fairly high uh, in order to generate the resisting torsional capability uh, but also we would expect that the deformation uh, in this section would also be uh, fairly high. And by the way all the incremental forces in this cross section be, can be paired in this manner. In other words, and, and that's the logical way to do it. For example, you could say, well, let's pair that one with that one. If you did that, you'd then have to say, well, we're going to pair that one with that one. Uh, both of which have fairly large lever arms, but they're tending to counteract each other. So if you really want to know what the net effect is of that arrow and that arrow, coupled together plus that arrow and that arrow coupled together, you can actually figure it out by just coupling these two together and coupling those two together. Um, and so no matter how you slice it and dice it on this cross section, all the arrows are paired in a manner where the lever arms are not very substantial. And so we'd have to say this is not a great cross section for providing torsional capability. On the other hand, if we have a closed section, those arrows don't sort of loop back on themselves like they do uh, 
in an I-beam, but they actually are able to find their way all the way around this tubular section. And now suddenly uh, every possible way of grouping these into force couples produces um, a very substantial lever arm. And I, I don't know why I drew this rectangle here, but you can imagine uh, grouping that arrow with that arrow and then the lever arm is the distance across here. And likewise, we can group that arrow with that. And so in every case, these force couples that we will identify will have substantial lever arms, which are the full dimension of the tubular section. And that happens in the case of round tubes. We can couple that force arrow with this force arrow over here, or that force arrow with that force arrow. And in, in every instance, we end up with a fairly substantial lever arm for the force arrows. So that would lead us to believe that the ability of these closed sections to generate internal resisting torsion will be much better than in the case of the I-beam. You may recall in chapter one, we actually showed this experiment. We have three different sections here, which were made out of equal amounts of 1 16th inch thick styrene sheet. On the top, we have a square tube. On the bottom, we have an eye section that has exactly the same amount of material in it. And, and then here we have the same amount of material consisting of several layers laminated together. And one of the things you'll notice is we've put the largest offset force on the square tube. And in spite of that, we see no visible deformation in that square tube. The smallest force here, offset force, has been put on the eye section, and you'll notice that there's a very substantial amount of torsional deformation in this eye section. And then somewhere in between, these slabs all glued together has a sort of intermediate force and some intermediate amount of deformation. But this is powerful and profound experimental verification of the fact that a an eye section or a wide flange section is the worst section you can possibly have for generating torsion. It works great as a beam under vertical forces or forces that are basically uh, parallel to the web member in the, in the beam, but they're really, really not good for torsion. Okay, so let's talk about a few examples that are commonly occurring where you have torsion that has to be accounted for and where you would prefer to use a, a tubular section. Um, here we have a classic situation of a spandrel beam at a wall. Uh, so here we have some brick, we have an air gap, we have some rigid insulation. Here is the corrugated uh, steel with concrete poured on top of it so that they work in composite action. Um, in this case, the ribs or the flutes of the corrugated material are running perpendicular to the plane of the drawing. So um, in that direction, the composite action is very strong and very good. In this other direction, it's not so very good. So if we put a big torsional force over here, we're going to tend to crack this concrete section. If we put an I-beam right here as our girder or our spandrel beam, that I-beam is going to be very uh, adversely affected. And the reason it is, it, reason is that out here, we have a huge amount of weight associated with the brick. And that brick is very substantially offset from the center line of this beam. So somewhere in the background, this beam is connected to a column. Um, that column is tending to support the beam along the center line of the beam. And then we have this angle, which we call a shelf angle. This, by the way, is another steel angle, which is called the pour stop angle. So it's what you bring the concrete to and then level the concrete with the edge of that pour stop. This angle is incorporated to reach out and support this brick, which is creating a very substantial eccentric load that's tending to rotate or twist 
this beam. So in this case we've shown this as a rectangular tube the point being that it's not just working in bending but it has to work in torsion in order to re receive this eccentric load from the brick. Um, somewhere in the background there's a column that's supporting this beam and this beam has to be connected to that column in a way that it can't twist or rotate about its center of action. So there's a, there's a special connector there also which is not like a simple clip angle connector it needs to be thought through in terms of how it resists um, these uh, torsional influences. This issue of the eccentric loading of brick is a common problem with masonry and this is a very logical structural response. This clip angle by the way aside from delivering highly eccentric loads to this tubular beam is also a uh, thermal bridge which is one of the huge problems associated with brick construction particularly in any kind of multi-story commercial building where we typically put out a shelf angle like that every story in the building it penetrates through the insulation supports the brick the brick has a fairly high conductivity which then comes into this uh, shelf angle and the thermal uh, transport shoots through that shelf angle and completely bypasses the insulation. So there's a very strong thermal connection between these bricks which during the winter time may be really cold and the steel structure inside the building. So there's often issues having to do with condensate on the steel uh, during the winter time when the uh, wicking of heat out through this shelf angle causes this portion of the structure to be really cold. And then of course during the summertime the sun can beat down on these bricks and cause them to become quite hot in which case heat is then transported into the building. At that point it's not a condensate problem but it still becomes a thermal uh, heat gain mechanism in the building. Okay, so that's, that's a really, really common, really mundane sort of uh, situation where you will have to account for torsion on this spandrel beam. There are other examples where torsion is a crucial issue. Here you'll notice we have a curved bridge which is only intermittently supported. So if there's a support here and another support back there somewhere, this curved portion of the, of the beam wants to keel over or fail in torsion and you'll notice in this case uh, it's been rendered as a round tube and the reasoning being that that's an elegant way to get good bending action and really excellent torsional action. Here's another example here we have a curved bridge it wants to rotate over um, and to prevent that from happening it's been rendered as a tube. In this case they've pulled the tube inward to give this uh, bridge a nice thin edge so it has a really elegant sweeping kind of quality to it but this closure is really crucial to the way this beam is performing. That ends our discussion of torsion in beams from chapter 6 Section 5.